continue on this theme of gender with a powerhouse trio of Mary Flanagan, who might be able to join us at the show in some part, um, who is part of Dartmouth and has been um, directing Tilt Factor. Uh, along with her is Jennifer Jensen, who is a professor. Not here. Oh, okay. Um, is Heidi then, um, who is CEO and creative director at the Future Perfect Lab. Sorry, I'll do this. All right, I thought you could totally. Oh, awesome! I was like, all right. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I just I, put, I pulled this off the internet because I think it 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 it, show, it speaks volumes. I mean, obviously, most of the most of the fathers in the room are probably horrified to see this image, right? But it but it suggests something we all know, and it suggests that games w that we play on an everyday basis, games that we look around. Uh, and, and see, um, you know, winning awards and being the, the part of culture become this, become this normalized world in which we say, oh yeah, there's some problems with Grand Theft Auto, but really it's, it's, not, it's not that bad. Or it's bad, but it's just a game. And, you know, we, can, we know we can minimize some of the issues going on. And, I, you know, uh, Heidi uh, was really interested in pulling out the hot coffee example. You know, everyone, GTA is like the ideal candidate to kind of really investigate this kind of stuff. But the point is it's not only in GTA. And that's the issue. We've got stuff internationally around the world jumping in with, uh, with, with, with stalking, sexual assault, and rape as kind of exploratory things. So when we have 15 oh my god moments, we might want to put these as our 15 oh my god moments. These are really political. They're violent and they're negative. Do you want to take? Sure. Um, so there are also a lot of less uh, egregious examples that we know of. Um, and oftentimes, like Anita Sarkeesian has talked about these two different polarized uh, examples from the damsel in distress, you know, very sort of seemingly innocuous, uh, like Donkey Kong, where the woman is always seen as not necessarily in bondage, but somebody who needs to be almost like a pre-Raphaelite saved uh, individual. Um, alternately, we end up get, seeing the, you know, the fighting, you know, Laura Croft type of fighting fuck toy. Um, you know, as the woman before us had mentioned, we see a lot of like unclad dress, you know, disproportionate breast size and the usual kind of stereotypic imagery. Um, but these images also just very quietly, surreptitiously transform both our value system and our psychological state inside, primarily the limbic system. So I guess part of what we'd like to do today, as opposed to focusing on the negative imagery, is to figure out different strategies and approaches for reinfusing positive values and what does that mean in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the challenge here, and one of the things that I'm very struck by, is that you know, in Games for Change, oftentimes what we are competing against are these triple title games, right? Who uh, not only have these negative imageries of women, racism, other forms of intolerance, but the violence is so overglorified and it's supported by the game mechanics, amazing storytelling, um, as well as you know the different types of feature sets. And we can't necessarily compete with that in terms of the budgets we're allocated, right, and the type of access and understanding we have for balancing message and engagement. 
Um, so one of the things, I just realized I'm standing on my heels as opposed to moving this down. <laughs> so part of um, my challenge or the impetus for making games for me is really can we find different strategies that we garner from the triple title world or the commercially slick environment and actually reappropriate them in such a way so that we don't continue making chocolate covered broccoli. Um, I, and and to, to get on this, I'm also interested in the ways we don't have to do AAA titles. So this is where Heidi and I differ on our, on our, on our ideas. So I, I don't think we need to be able to do that, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, we have really interesting games emerging, some more effective than others, um, some not so interesting, actually, I mean, I, to be honest, about challenging sexual violence. So there are um, games emerging from groups trying to say, hey, let's, let's, let's rethink this, let's train people to, you know, to like college freshmen to, you know, learn sexual assault prevention. Um, and, and in this particular example, if the maker's here, I'm apologizing to you now, but, but, but the quiz, you wander around as this black shadow and wander up to people in a park and you get factoids about, uh, you, you get to make choices in your, uh, about sexual assault issues and then just say congratulations. You know, this, this is nowhere near something that anyone would voluntarily play. We know this. <laughs> so so what, what would people actually play and what can we really do? Like, how do we go to J Games for Change 2.0? Oh, here's another great example. Um, you know, where you have a lot of sexual assault problems in the military. The military is going to address this with the game, and I think that they could actually pull it off if they spent more than $80,000 in their budget to do their sexual assault <laughs> prevention game, right? Yeah. Um, here's another one um, on watch. It, it, kind of, it kind of puts the victim in this kind of like emergency control center way where you can uh, you know, walk with friends and call 911 you know, in, in an emergency situation. Um, it's kind of gamified, so you can walk around and kind of gather friends to protect you. It's empowering. On the other hand, it's kind of a problematic assumption that we, that we actually are policing the victim even more um, with our technologies rather than figuring out how we are making a better culture. Yeah. So I guess um, one of the things that I thought was interesting, this is a study by Wang and Ritterfeld. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this text, uh, but they did a study of over 120 different um, serious games, uh, games for social change and others that are more simulation based for training and such. And they discovered that very few of them actually touched upon any of what they call the super boost fun factors. And the top five really have to do with sort of visual, auditory aesthetics, uh, gameplay me mechanics, meaning are they diversified enough, and the basic package, right, that you might see in sort of the commercial sector. And again, this is where we differ. Um, so, but for me, I think if you cannot reach this threshold of enjoyment, right, or play or pleasure, then actually the learning can't take place. And oftentimes we make a false assumption that games for change, learning happens because things are fun. So I think this needs to be unpackaged a little bit more. Um, so this is a quote from myself, actually. <laughs> uh, so I guess for me, in terms of my theory of social change, what interests me is how can we change culture, the capital C, through culture. And for me, it really is through popular culture, popularizing the forms, so that we can quietly and surreptitiously transform the way in which we think and feel. Right? And the way in which we do that is really looking at the cognitive and effective cues right, in mechanics that we see in the, you know, the commercial sphere. Um, so what we want to do here is to point out that there are other examples besides the you know, more, um, I guess, serious uh, games that have mobile apps and these things that are very direct and look at some alternatives uh, within our community where people are really kind of pushing the boundaries both in terms of platforms, genres, and sort of mechanics. Yeah, so Hey Baby is a project made by Su Yin Lui um, in two, when was that? 2010? No, 20, 20, yeah. Uh, you know. A while ago, <laughs> um, and it was a first-person shooter um, in which uh, uh, you play the role of someone just going about her business, and um, you experience uh, street calls, cat calls, and um, you just can shoot people. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the ultimate, you know. Ah, uh, if you know you're into that. Oh, Hit the Bitch is a, is a controversial Danish game. Many of you have probably heard of this. If not, it's really something to look up. Uh, it was a way in which the game designers were trying to engage. Um, as a sense of empathy for the victim by putting you in the, in, the, in the role of the perpetrator and having you hit a woman as she's talking to you and kind of de being derogatory to you, towards you. And basically what happened is it, it was a social, social justice campaign. It meant well, but it also may have reinforced the actual kinds of cultural practices we have. And without the research to back up the efficacy of this project, we are left with a kind of interesting cocktail argument um, of somewhat, some passion. 
Okay, this is a project of mine, Awkward Moment. One of the things that I'm trying to do in culture change, I'm going to talk about this in the Games for Change 2.0 talk I'm giving this afternoon, is to say, okay, we have these cultural issues, we have social issues. How do we address the underlying biases that lead to these problems in the first place? Because if we're not addressing these biases, for example, I'll point out a bias just today that you might want to look at. How many examples are you finding in people's talks um, by women, people of color, transgender people? How many examples? Count them. Um, go through the conference and think about how we are telling our own story. That is a bias, right? So if we start to un... That's right, we can, we can go fast. <laughs> so Awkward Moment is a, is a game um, that is a card game, but I, you can do this in board games, card games, sports, whatever, um, where we have... Specific, I have two psychologists working in my lab. We've specifically designed and tested and studied ways in which we can do social intervention and bias changing through psychological approaches to game design. So I'm going to talk about that later, but I just want to point out that it's possible and it's very effective. Um, uh, Dominique Pomplemousse is, is a really interesting game by, uh, uh, that, that is another example of, uh, it's this crazy stop motion detective opera. Um, I encourage you to work, it's by Deirdre um, Kiai, uh, who, uh, uh, hmm? Who's transgender? Well, I don't have to talk about that. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> it, but it, it deals with transgender issues, and um, it's a really interesting story about, uh, about, um, uh, a detective who's kind of having a crisis. And the transgender uh, reveal is basically embedded in the narrative. It's not a big deal. It's not a transgender game. I'm going to adapt to you know, learning transgender issues. It actually normalizes interesting alternative points of view. Oh, uh, and this is the game that I designed a couple of years ago. Um, and basically it's an alternate reality game with different missions over the course of 12 weeks. But one of the issues we dealt with was looking at the issue of human trafficking and assault case. So basically you're paying, playing kind of like a pseudo right-wing CIA agent and you're using um, different types of nonlinear strategies to solve the case. Um, so I guess what we wanted to get to, because we only have about a minute, is there are some, so these games are really kind of starting to push, right, different approaches to looking at gender-based violence, assault, and these sorts of things. But what are some other things that we could do in terms of strategy to really amplify some of these issues in a nuanced way? So we start to look at four different approaches, one of which is looking at what Mary's doing in terms of her research around PR, looking going back to PR strategies and behavioral psychology. Mm -hmm. um, we only have a minute, so I guess I'll just yeah, do just, this quickly. Just, just summarize um, Secondly, a lot of my research or theory looks at embodied cognition or theories of cognitive neuroscience as a way of building that into the iterative design process or co-design process. So I really look at four key issues, dynamic coupling, cognitive scaffolding, niche construction, and mirror neurons. So I won't get into that. <laughs> and then two other features are really looking at the role of embodiment. I think there are a lot of new, you know, emerging technologies that are starting to, you know, natural and organic user interfaces that allow us to bring the body and affect back into the experience to reify the centrality, right, of our sexuality. Um, and then lastly, I would say the one key thing I think Mary and I really agree on is that there are very, very few, and this is a study by Grazer, um, but very, very few scientifically rigorous right, approaches to really looking at what we are doing, right, and if the impact is really happening. And part of what I think really needs to happen is investment dollars need to go into triangulating biometric fMRI and EEG data sets um, to really determine... Or psychological the, the research. Yes. Couple, coupled with psychological research. And or, yeah. Um, so I think what we decided to do is try to end with a creative question as opposed to continue making statements. So we thought taking some of these, you know, emerging strategies that we just mapped out, these four, is there a way to start thinking about harnessing some of these approaches, right, to restore positive images to gender and sexuality? So we'll leave you with that and maybe I'll open up some discussion later on. And one last, one last thing, one last plug. Um, the Twine community is an interesting place to find low budget, really interesting narratives about um, alternate points of view and alternate experiences um, in this free game system. There are a lot of examples that we, can, we didn't get to share and I just want to point out that, that this isn't a canon. It's about re really trying to find diverse um, approaches to expressing one's self. Also, um, if you're interested in the research, if you contact me, um, I can send you some links to some important papers such as you know, normalized sexual assault being um, a, a kind of precursor to a rape culture. Thank you. A lot of really rich, amazing examples, and they will both be hanging around.